everyone. Good afternoon uh, and welcome to today's Development uh, study Seminar Series. Um, before we start, could I just ask, I can't see any, but in case I can't, if there are empty spaces, um, could you just move along? Because I think we're looking pretty full and I think other people might come along after classes. Um, okay, great. I don't think there actually are any. <laughs> Not that one. Um, okay, well, it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon. Um, we have um, Professor Danny Dorling here from the University of Oxford, um, uh, who is our main speaker, and uh, Dr. Al Bashar from the LSE, who is going to act as a discussant. Um, Professor Danny Dorling is Professor of Human Geography at Oxford. He's also worked at Sheffield, Newcastle, uh, Bristol, Leeds, and New Zealand. He went to university in Newcastle upon Tyne and grew up in Oxford. He has published over 40 books, including many atlases, um, and Population 10 Billion, All That Is Solid, Injustice, Why Social Inequalities Still Persist, A Better Politics, How Government Can Make Us Happier, and The Equality Effect, which was this year. Um, Professor Dorling's latest book is being sold just outside. If you go outside and turn to the right, um, Rani, who is from the Soas Tamar Society bookseller um, group, is, is selling it. But you should also have a leaflet as well if you want to order it. We also have um, Dr. Al Bashar. Uh, Dr. Shah is Associate Professor at the Department of Anthropology in the LSE. Her research and writing focuses on poor and marginalized people in India and Nepal. Uh, she explores the processes of inequality people get caught in and various ways in which they try to subvert them. She's lived for several years as an anthropologist amidst the people that she writes about. Her first book, In the Shadows of the State, was on indigenous rights and politics of Adivasis in Charkand in India. And she's currently writing a book on India's Maoist-inspired Naxalite re revolutionary struggle. Um, she's also leading the program of uh, research on inequality and poverty, which has been funded by um, major research grants from the ESRC and the EU, along with our own um, Dr. Jens Lerke. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, ask uh, Professor Dorling to start speaking. He will have 40 minutes, give or take, um, and then Professor Shah will come and discuss um, his presentation for around five minutes, and then I'll turn over to the audience. So do you want to go ahead? Thank you. Can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah. yeah. I promise to keep to 40 minutes, uh, maybe less. The map up there is just to give you something to look at while I waffle on for a couple of minutes at the beginning. Uh, I'm going to start with the punchline. The punchline is that the insurrection has already begun. What you normally hear when people give talks about inequality and insurrection it's an argument about why things are very terrible, why they're getting worse, and why as a result of that you need some kind of uprising to make them better. That was the kind of story I was taught when I was the age that many of you are. I was taught it by men a generation older than me, who did their work in the 1960s and 70s, and said everything was terrible, there needs to be an insurrection, there needs to be a revolution to make it better. And there wasn't. Now I could be as wrong as them. There is a very good likelihood that when I say the insurrection has already begun, I'm wrong. But it would be a shame if it has begun, if I couldn't share the idea it has begun with some other people. Um, so we could be the only people in the world who know this thing has started. What those men, they were almost all men in the past, got wrong was that inequality actually wasn't awful in the 1960s and 70s. It wasn't a utopia. It wasn't great if you're female. It was even worse if you were black. But working people had never had it so good. We had never seen the degree of equality in incomes in modern times for centuries. At the time when people were saying, this is absolutely terrible. They went on to start magazines like New Left Review and so on. You can look back and see those quotes. Now, they weren't entirely wrong. Things were not brilliant. And they weren't stupid. We simply didn't have the data then, or it wasn't as accessible to be able to tell that, in fact, it wasn't that bad. OK, enough of the world map.
Inequality and insurrections go together. You can make a claim that almost all of the major religions of the world were started in a time of great inequality and were often started because of that inequality. People were told that riches won't get you into heaven, you need to believe something different, and if you believe that different thing, everything will be better. Or in the Quran, they're told that the merchants moving between cities are bad, and they are immoral. You can go through the world religions, and look at the time and place they started, and you can say, that was a kind of insurrection. You can look at revolutions. You can look at the American Revolution, the French Revolution and so on. And obviously, we're on the 100 year anniversary of the Russian Revolution. You don't tend to get revolutions unless there's something very unequal about your society. Otherwise, there really isn't something worth revolting about. Um, things go wrong when you have high inequalities. But they don't necessarily alter that quickly. When people began new religions, it could take decades, if not centuries, for the religion to catch on. I always feel sorry for people who started religions because most of them must have failed. There are about 32 major religions in the world, but of course there would have been many, many others. Let's bring ourselves up to date here. Thomas Piketty says the reason that the elite ought to worry about inequality <coughs> is that there will be trouble ahead. Otherwise, if you read Piketty, he's not that animated about it. <coughs> he had an effect. If you look at what the world's business leaders in Davos said this January, they only had one thing on their minds, it was inequality. That was because of Trump. But they associated Trump with rising inequality. <coughs> the year before, the business leaders in Davos has said it was unemployment, which we keep on forgetting, climate change and inequality as a top three. Barack Obama had inequality as his number one problem of the world. The president of China, the same about a year later. The head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, about a year later. The Pope had it. It's not that new. The last point there, and I find this, I find this really interesting, and it really, it does apply to Theresa May. She's the best example of this. Politicians are very good at talking about inequality and utterly failing to even pretend that they care convincingly. Um, and that seems odd to me. You know, you'd have thought they'd have worked out a way of making it look as if they care. But it's still, for some people, particularly on the right, an anathema. Inequality is good for them. It rewards talent. It allows those with ability to rise to the top and rule. It keeps the dross down. It stops things going to rack and ruin. There are people who like inequality. If there were not, we wouldn't have so much. We would stop it. We get the most incredible arguments today for inequality. My favourite argument for inequality is student loans. Student loans is an argument for future inequality. The student loan argument goes like this. You lot need to take out a loan to come and study in this university because you're going to be paid so much more in the future. Because we are determined we're going to have a really unequal future in this country, in the world. And because we're determined that the future is going to be unequal and you're going to be the winners, honest, Believe me, it's a lie, by the way. <laughs> but because we're determined that you're going to be paid more in the future, you have to take a student loan out now, it wouldn't be fair otherwise on the poor. It's the most stupid argument I have ever heard in my life, and I am stunned that it carries any water. It's an argument for future inequality. It's almost a eugenic argument, you know, we've selected you with the special genes and abilities to come to this place. And we're now going to give you the knowledge over three years, and a few lectures, not that many notice, but we're going to give you the knowledge over three years, <laughs> so that you can go out and efficiently run this country and the world. Remember, it's SOAS, 
because we've got the rest of the world, well, half of it, <laughs> at the same time. And because of the great burden, it used to be called the white man's burden, but now we just call it the multicultural burden. Because of the great burden you're going to have to have running other people's lives for them, you're going to have to be paid a lot more than the people you give orders to. Oh, and by the way, we need you to take out a student loan because of this. Right? We can talk about this later. I promise not to go on and on and on. But this is the kind of ridiculous thing you get. You, of course, only have these student loans in very unequal rich countries. The USA, Chile, us. Not elsewhere in Europe. People don't treat their children like this elsewhere in Europe. I was talking to a group of students in my own university last week and trying to explain to them, on average, 8% of students have no loan. But in my university it'll be higher, here it'll be higher. 8% have no loan, they have nothing to pay back. The rich are actually allowed not to have a loan because somebody pays their fees for them. The idea that this is something which is about redistributing between the rich and the poor it's laughable given that 8% of students across all of Britain, and many more in Oxford and many more in Soas, don't pay a penny. Their parents pay. And then I have to explain, because we're in a very unequal and strange country, that those students did nothing to make their parents rich. Right? It's not that you've worked very hard as a toddler or a school child to make your parents rich. Oh, sorry, I'm, let's go on. <laughs> this, this is the graph of inequality um, for the UK. There are many different ways of measuring inequality. They all tend to show the same thing. This is the share of income of the top 1%. The top line is that share before taxes. The bottom line is the share after taxes. A hundred years ago, around the time of the Russian Revolution, the top 1%, 1 in 100 people, took a fifth of all income. In this country, in this city, and in most rich countries of the world. That's why that starts up near 20%. That's why you've got these big houses around here with rooms for the servants in the attic and rooms for the servants in the basement. And the most common job for a woman was to be a servant. And Britain was not that different from other rich countries. And then something happened. And that something began to reduce inequality. You can see the lines beginning to go down. And nobody knew it was going down. And that may be just maybe what is happening now, but with a less impressive something. The something back then was the First World War. Inequality hit its peak in 1913, when the Titanic sank. In the First World War, it was supposed to be a war that just lasted a few weeks or months. The rich got it wrong, it went on and on and on. It costs money. There's only one group of people who got any money when you have that kind of inequality. It's the richest 1%. They had to be taxed because the war went on. Then there was a revolution in Russia. That's really scary if you're in the top 1%. And it actually happens. Inequality fell. We won't go into why. It fell a bit later in the USA, but that patterns most of Europe. It fell and it fell and it fell. It fell even faster after the Second World War, because the elite really showed they didn't have a clue what they were doing when they took people to war for a second time like that. They entirely lost their credibility. And it got down to the point when I was a child, or the best off 1% after tax took just 4% of all income. That's the equivalent of £100,000 today. 100000 against an average income of 25. That's what happened in this country when I was the age that you are. I grew up in that place. It was a different place. I think it was a nicer place in many ways. And then from the late 70s onwards, inequality rose and rose. Until recently, where something may have happened. But that's in the UK. It is different in other affluent countries, but people in the UK and the USA don't know this. Uh, the most equal large rich country in the world is Japan. That's its inequality ratio for the best off tenth to the worst off tenth, when we try to include all the income of the rich. Then conveniently, Finland, Norway and Sweden, Germany, Austria, Slovenia, 
South Korea, Denmark, Belgium, Switzerland. Switzerland is a kind of average country for inequality in Europe. Swiss bankers are paid half as much each as bankers in London. And where do we need bankers? We don't need them in London now. Do you have to pay them so much to stay in London when you don't need them in London anymore? Anyway, something's going on. France, the Netherlands, Ireland, Canada, Greece, Spain, Italy, New Zealand, Australia, then Israel, going up in terms of the inequality stakes. Israel, the best off tenth every year after tax, have 13 times more than the poorest tenth in Israel. Israel is a very unequal country. It has big divides within it. I never say much more about Israel than that. <laughs> Enough people say things about Israel. What I like to say, and what people don't say, is that the United Kingdom is more unequal than Israel. If you think Israel's got a problem... <laughs> right? But we've kind of got used to our problem. This went up subtly, cleverly. It went up by rewarding talent. That was what it was called. It went up initially under Margaret Thatcher, who made sure that the top third of society all benefited from squeezing more towards the top. But then that ended. Portugal, which has now changed, the United States, and then Singapore. Singapore's a lovely little test case of what happens. Um, we don't have enough really unequal places to study. Um, forgetting about people's lives and misery. We have lots and lots of more equitable countries in the world. We don't have enough unequal ones. That's the nerd slide just in case we need to come back to it later if somebody wants to argue with me about the stats or they, they've changed and so on. Nobody ever does, which shows that I am particularly nerdy and you are normal. Um, but there you'll notice, oh, annoyingly, no, Israel has just pipped us, but it's basically the same most recently. Okay. So you're living in a weird place. But you don't necessarily know it's weird if you're used to it. Just as people in the United States do not know that they're living in a really strange place. Right? Unless, unless they travel out and see other places. This is the second most nerdy slide. David Goodhart has a letter in the London Review of Books this week. You can see how posh I am. I'm in the 3%, in case you wondered. Um, the 3% is the entire, entire professorial salary range, by the way. So I'm not giving anything away. But I read the London Review of Books. And in David Goodhart's letter, he makes about seven mistakes in an amazingly short amount of time. One of which is to say that inequality in Britain has been falling since the 90s. Now that bottom graph is where he gets it from. And it isn't just David Goodhart. Everybody to the right of David Goodhart says this as well. That bottom graph is the ratio of the medium of the richest fifth to the medium of the poorest fifth, and it peaked around about 992. Nobody noticed. Nobody noticed that we were slowly becoming more equal in the middle because of that great big thick line above, which David Goodhart ignores, which is the take of the 1%. Going up and up and up and up. So if you have a small group of people, I ought to work out how many national health services this is. Right? By the end, when you head up towards 15%, that is 15% of all national income, of everything, going to just 1% of people. But look, something happens around about 2012. We're not quite sure what did happen. There was tax avoidance going on as well, but it's interesting. And then we got August this year. And August this year was a time for celebration. August the 3rd, there should have been street parties. People should have got the bunting out. They should have pulled out the trestle tables. And they should have celebrated. Forget the Queen's silver or gold jubilee. This was the most dramatic thing that has happened since I was born in Britain. And nobody noticed. And why don't they notice? Well, they may not notice because it might not be true. The average boss of the 100 biggest companies took a pay cut of around about a million pounds last year. One reaction is to say, oh, 
they found another way to take the money. We don't trust them. That's a perfectly normal reaction. They are not particularly nice people. But the lovely thing about the analysis showed that, in fact, the men took a bigger pay cut than the women, and the 25% of highest paid people, which were almost all men, took the biggest pay cut of all. So we even have growing equality amongst chief executive officers. Part of the reason that nobody noticed was that the inequality is still far, far too high. It's a little like sitting in 1919 and saying, oh, it's much better than 1913, isn't it? Right? It didn't feel that much better. In fact, you just lost 50-odd million people due to a flu pandemic. Right? So it didn't feel good. But nothing like this has happened in the last 50 years. And by the way, it happened a year earlier in the United States. And again, around about a million dollars for the Fortune 300 chief executive officers. And what happened there, which is different to here, is that the average worker in the United States saw a pay increase of $900 a year. Only 900 That's the thing about inequality. You have to take a million away from the top to get $900 at the bottom. But it happened. It may be happening. There are lots and lots of other signs of this. Before the banking crash in 2008, you used to see news programmes showing bankers celebrating deals and buying bottles of champagne, in one case for £30,000, for one rather large bottle, which did have a diamond in it, but the diamond was only worth £10,000. All that kind of behaviour has ended. It's gone. The moral sentiment has changed. You have a Conservative Minister of Universities calling on Vice-Chancellors to get their pay down to £100,000. This is really good news. This is the kind of thing that happened before. It happened in the 1920s and 1930s. There was a banker called Oswald Foulkes, who had a friend called John Maynard Keynes, who lived very near here. And Oswald Foulkes told John Maynard Keynes that what Keynes had done wasn't to invent some amazing new theory of economics. All he'd actually done was contribute towards the changing moral sentiment of the times. It's happened before and it's happening now. And when the moral sentiment changes, that is what it's normal to believe, how it's normal to act, what it's normal to think, you don't notice it changing because you change with it. I'm just going to show you a series of graphs very quickly about why this kind of thing matters. It was very hard to know how important inequality was 100 years ago, because all the rich countries of the world were almost identically unequal. And it was very hard to know how much inequality mattered in the 1960s and 70s, because they all became, in a similar way, more equal. The inequality measures were similar. But then the most wonderful thing happened. Some countries stayed equal. Norway, Japan, the Netherlands, and got a little bit more equal. Other countries, the UK, the USA, became rapidly more unequal. And they created an environment in which we can see what happens. Now, it isn't that inequality causes things. It is the kind of cock-up associated with allowing rich people to get richer and richer is associated with many other cock-ups. Right? So this isn't about correlation and causation. It's about an amazing set of coincidences. Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett in the spirit level almost 10 years ago first showed these kind of things for 13 variables. Now we have many, many more. Uh, this little bubble chart is showing you the propensity of people to walk or cycle to work. Now Americans do not wake up in the morning, check their inequality statistic and decide to get in the car. But America is a country which is based on individuality, where it's seen as fine if people have no other option but driving to work. That doesn't happen in the Netherlands. There are reasons why the UK and the USA became more unequal. It's not something fundamentally wrong with us. We had the disadvantages of not being invaded and a disadvantage of having been countries number one and two in the world economically in the last 150 years. Just some more things to show you. A lot of these are very speculative. 
But they're interesting. We already know that obesity is very closely correlated to inequality. The more unequal your country, the fatter you are amongst rich nations. Um, <laughs> in the UK, Public Health England have produced the most beautiful graphs a couple of months ago for every decile area showing the obesity rates for children aged 11. Children aged 11 in the poorest 10th areas are twice as likely to be as beast as children aged 11 in the richest areas, and the gap is growing. Quite an incredible graph. But what's behind it is they're all living in the UK. If we looked at another country, you'd find that the poorest children are not getting much fatter than the richest children. I'm putting meat up there because those of you who are interested in the environment will know that the planet burns if we carry on eating as much meat. The interesting question is why people in more equal countries are better at not eating meat as opposed to more unequal countries. Water. This is domestic water consumption, which I'm always running out of. What's going on there? The kind of thing that's going on there is that in the United States, when there's a drought warning because there might be forest fires over, let's say, California, a significant group of affluent people decide they're going to ignore that ban because hell, they know what's best for them and they're going to fill their swimming pool because it's their God-given right. That's the kind of behaviour you get in a very unequal country. In more equal countries, people worry about what their neighbours think of them. Maybe almost too much in Japan. But people do behave. Do behave very well. Not everything always lines up brilliantly. The United Kingdom is a bit cold for swimming pools. Um, waste collection. If I want to know how much all of you consume, what I need to do is work out how much goes out of you when you go to the toilet. That tells me largely about how much you eat, a bit of energy. I need to know about your jewellery because you tend to keep that, but everything else, everything you're wearing, everything you've bought, two or three years, it'll all go in the bin. So all we need to do is, is weigh what goes in the bin. And again, you'll see consumption is higher in more unequal countries. Denmark and Switzerland may be better at <coughs> measuring waste. These things have only been measured twice for these countries ever. So the data is often very wrong. But I'm showing you even the things that don't look too good. Carbon dioxide, OK, exceptions to Australia. But Australia could have arranged itself differently. These get more complicated over time. This is carbon footprint. People often say, oh, it's all just generated by the United States, that one big red blob. That's what makes this pattern. Well, just take all the states in the United States, treat them all as separate countries, and let's see what happens. And the most unequal states have higher carbon footprints, and you get a nice pattern. The little graph that's far away from me is uh, patents. People in unequal countries like to tell themselves lies to make themselves feel better. One of which is that they're more inventive and entrepreneurial because the inequality has allowed the gifted to rise to the top. Okay, who's the most famous inventor in the UK? Leave you with that for later. It's not the man who did the internet, that was the American military. You might find something in your toilets here. Dyson, aren't we just a nation of entrepreneurs? Right? It's a vacuum cleaner. But we managed, you know, somehow we managed to turn that into a, a heroic story of British manufacturing. Um, more seriously, infant mortality is very low, very closely related. Same again with the United States, infant mortality is going up in Mississippi at the moment. It's not just that the things are related, it's that they're getting worse. Singapore, by the way, looks like an exception. Singapore doesn't allow the 100,000 poorest women to become pregnant in Singapore. We only know this. This is only becoming well known around the world because of graphs like this. Where people go, oh, why is Singapore there? You go, oh, because you can't have children if you're very poor. And if you can't have children, they can't die. 
Life expectancy is the graph that's further away from me. Only one country in Western Europe has had no rise in life expectancy between 2011 and 2015. It's us. Right? David Cameron and Theresa May are the worst performing Prime Ministers by that central measure of well-being that this country has ever had. But people don't know that. This country. Just a few more slides. I'll pass over to Alfred. Like I say, it's already begun to turn. But when it turns in this way, when it doesn't turn fast, when you lose a war, you have a revolution. When it turns in, in this way that it's turning, it can take decades to carry on turning and you need constant renewal and understanding of why. Trust reduces. This is an untrustful country. The standard kind of trust question is, would you ask a stranger on the train to look after your bag when you went to the toilet? People in more equal countries just say yes. We say no. The answer is that your bag will almost certainly be safe with any stranger picked at random. You've just been made untrustworthy. And that is there all the time in your behaviour. We learn less well and we compete more. How many people have been to school in the USA or UK? Minority, but significant. Okay. This is where I tell you you're not as clever as you think you are, despite the grades you've got. We think competing makes us clever. I'm going to show you maths, but we get the same thing for problem solving and for literacy. These are PISA tests, international tests of mathematical ability. Along the bottom, you've got inequality. Along the side, you've got how well children around about age 15 do at maths. And we could do you a maths test now. And we can see whether you are like, such as Greece, UK, and United States are low. But this is what's really fascinating, because you're not 15, you're a little bit older. Same test done at people aged 24. Same maths test. <coughs> it's just a clue. We're just beginning to learn from what's going on. Well, think about your maths. We're in SOAS. How many courses does SOAS run that really requires you to be any good at maths? Right? What maths do you actually need? I won't ask who got an A or an A star at maths, but in this country, in the United States, we teach people how to get grades on a particular day. Now that is not the same as learning maths. And we don't know that. In all these other countries, they do a better job of teaching this thing called mathematics, which is about understanding how abstract quantities and notions can be related to each other and if you're presented with a problem you haven't been presented with for several years you might be able to solve it and even possibly enjoying it right that's what teaching maths is actually about teaching people to get high grades is a brilliant way of not teaching them how to do maths i'll, I'll leave that there but it's really hard to understand if you've grown up in a place like this and it makes us stupid. It makes it possible for a man who left school at age 15 or 16 from Dulwich College to stand in front of a poster like this and get his way with 52% of the population. It makes it possible for Trump to win in the United States. It's why the Front National didn't win in France, because they're cleverer. Why the fascists didn't do very well in the Netherlands. <laughs> right? It's very hard to take. But inequality really matters because it actually makes you stupid. And that, <laughs> I know. We're in a university. Far right voting. Far right voting according to the New York Times. 20... Rich countries down here, I haven't fixed the data, it's all the data for which the World Income and Wealth data set gives you data. And I call voting Trump far right. Okay, without Trump I couldn't have drawn this, but see a kind of relationship, the more unequal you are your state, the more likely you are to vote Trump. The more unequal your country, the more likely you are to vote Trump. 
France was voting too high, luckily it's gone down, and thankfully for me, if not anybody else, the Germans have jumped up to 12% for the far right recently, so they've gone back on the line, right, where they ought to be. Um, lots of countries don't even have a far right party, down at the bottom. If you find that hard to take, and it is dodgy, I think would be the technical word, but interesting to do, the other graph there is, is simply turnout in elections. And you'll see that the more uh, unequal a country, the less people bother to vote. Of course, in Australia, you have to vote by law, but a good plucky 9% of Australians don't. Uh, and Singapore, it's a similar edict. You don't have to vote, but if you don't vote, you have to pay a fine if you ever want to vote again. It's quite clever. This is the segregation index of the Conservative Party. It's how many Conservative voters you'd have to move to get an even spread of Conservative voters around the country. I've run out of time, so I haven't got time to go on about it. But it's very like the inequality curve. That's what just happened to it in June of this year, which excites me, but not any of you. <laughs> this is much more exciting. Again, the graph is hard to understand. But it's the average uh, strength of uh, public opinion supporting a Labour government. How many people to vote for Labour to an election tomorrow? Plummets, 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 plummets with Corbyn. Worst ever leader of the Labour Party. How can we have an idiot like that in charge of the Labour Party? Until March 2017, when it begins to turn. And then, bam, in May, if you average all the polls, you get a 6% swing. The biggest swing that's ever happened in any polling in British history. It goes up to the 1st of June, up to 36%. By election day, we're up to 40%. We've never seen anything like it before. That's a form of insurrection. Very boring form of insurrection, actually bothering <laughs> to turn out to vote. But I call it an uprising because it's never happened before. Not that fast, not that quick, not that many people. It resulted in a swing which was only smaller than the swing in 1945, and the swing in 1945 was a swing over 10 years, not two, that involved a world war. It was quite incredible what happened in June of this year. We are an extremely weird country. This is how much of GDP we, we choose to spend on public services, because we have things like private schools that a decent country doesn't have. In a decent country, your children go to school with everybody else, and you care about the schools. Not rocket science, and they're cleverer, all of them collectively, including the rich kids. We segregate our children, and hence we go down and we don't spend. And that's my last slide. And that's the student debt in the USA, and we're growing the student debt now. Now, I could be wrong, easily wrong. In fact, I'm almost certainly wrong in many, many things. It's possible that this is just a blip, that the future's Blade Runner, that the rich will carry on taking more and more after this one year off, that we'll just buy lottery tickets, take out our student loans, get <coughs> sanctioned and believe them and even vote for them as they take away more and more and more. That's possible. It just hasn't happened elsewhere as bad as that. It's possible that next summer the cities of Britain will be full of youth, there'll be barricades everywhere, the police won't be able to cope, there'll be an emergency election and the new revolutionary party to the left of Corbyn will sweep in and take power. It's possible, I can just tell you statistically, it would be quite an event. Right? This doesn't happen. It's possible, and this is where I worry about being more likely to be wrong, that we get a few nods, a few kind of, oh, student fees, we'll bring them down to 8,000 and make a market, you know. We get some caps on energy prices. We get somebody talking about rent regulation, but it won't actually happen. We'll leave the EU. We'll become a treasure island. We'll be really nasty to people who are not allowed to be here to try to make other people feel better about themselves. Think about Beijing whether you're allowed to work in Beijing or whether you're somebody who comes in from elsewhere in China and you have fewer rights. That's how you keep the population of Beijing happy. You treat other people worse. We could do that. 
Or alternatively, we could actually learn from all the evidence that's coming out that it's not in anybody's interest, including the very rich, including Philip Hammond, including Theresa May, including the people who bank the Conservative Party, it actually isn't even in their interest to carry on being such an embarrassing extreme of a country anymore. And the insurrection which has already begun will carry on and on and on as it did in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s to eventually we become a country where somebody may say, look at how they do education. Look at how they house the population. Look at their working week. Look at the things they've invented. Isn't that really interesting? That must be a nice place to grow up in and to try and start a family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Alpa, who will um, act as discussant for around five minutes, and then over to you guys. Thanks so much, Nithya. Um, thanks so much, Professor Dorling. Uh, I, I'll, I, I will not take five minutes. I'll just want to let out a few thoughts to while you all uh, in the audience get your own thoughts going. Uh, to maybe expand some of our, our discussion. Um, I, 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 I totally agree with you, uh, Professor Dorling, that the insurrection has already begun, but I would perhaps expand your analysis both temporally and spatially. I think that um, uh, to take the temporal, uh, to take the spatial first, I think that uh, in, uh, in, in today's world, or perhaps even well, much earlier too, we can't really afford to think about inequality without thinking about the global south alongside the global north. And I think today we cannot afford to think about inequality without placing the analysis of China and India uh, you know, central to our analysis of inequality uh, in the countries that you've, you've shown here. Uh, so I would like us to think about what would happen to some of your arguments if we took, uh, if we took some of these countries, um, uh, especially China and India, uh, centrally into our analysis. And I, I think that um, if we did, then we may see that, yes, uh, insurrection, the insurrection has already begun, but it actually began much earlier. Uh, so in the 1960s, when, you know, there wasn't allegedly an insurrection here. In fact, people were fighting against inequality. I mean, it was a time, uh, a subject that's dear to my heart is the, it's the spread of the Naxalite, um, you know, the Marxist-Leninist Maoist insurgency uh, in India, mm -hmm. which actually began in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, and today is one of the, well, it is the longest standing armed revolutionary struggle in the world. But that's just one example of, you know, many other things were going on in China, the Cultural Revolution, etc. Many of these revolutions, the anti-colonial revolutions, they may have turned into something very different later on. But this fight against the inequality has been alive and kicking for a very long time. So I think one of the things that, that your presentation makes me think is that, um, you know, one of the things you said is there comes a point when people can no longer be fooled into believing that uh, all this is fair. Um, and I think that uh, I would argue that people have never been fooled into believing that inequality is fair. The real issue is um, when is it that they're being listened to? Why? Uh, what are the forces uh, driving that? So I would, I would possibly slightly amend your central messages as the insurrection having been around much earlier uh, and, and also that, um, that people have never been fooled. The question really is um, 
when and why are they being listened to. So in, in relation to that, I would love to hear a little bit more about your own uh, analysis of these amazing figures that you showed, especially with, with last year and the one million um, pay cut and, uh, you know, the, that the CEOs took. So it would be great to actually try to get a deeper understanding from you about why this happened and how this happened and what you think, you know, are the, are the reasons behind it. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, uh, I guess another, another major issue for me has been um, the form of insurrection and, and what your thoughts might be on the kinds of struggles that we, we are seeing now and that you think are really important now to challenge inequality. Because, of course, for a long time, you know, many leftist movements have been kind of waiting for that working class struggle that's going to you know, take over and spread across the world, the move from, you know, a, a class um, for itself to a class, a class in itself to a class for itself. Um, so, I, I, and this, you know, we're not seeing this form of working class struggle in many parts of the world. Do you think that we're going to see it emerging here now? Or how do we expand? You know, do you go, what are your, your own theories of insurrection? Do you take inspiration from um, E.P. Thompson, for example, who argued that class struggle can come across in many forms? What are the different forms of struggle uh, that you think are going to be kind of um, central to, to the insurrection that has um, already um, begun. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess on that note, I also wanted to draw your attention to, you know, the audience that is to this exhibition that we've got going on in the Brunei Gallery here, which is focusing on India, which is, as, which is very much about inequality and the insurrection ag against it, and which shows many different forms of struggles um, uh, that are central to, to the fight against uh, inequality. Um, uh, okay, um, yeah, I think I'll probably, uh, I'll probably leave it there, but um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think the China-India thing is really significant because the dollar, number of dollar billionaires, for example, has significantly grown in China and India. So now you know, the, the, the four countries that have more dollar billionaires than anywhere else in the world is US, Germany, China, and India. So you know, what's happening there and, and where, you know, what is the, in so many parts of the world, we see actually the, the rise of the far right as opposed to you know, our wonderful kind of Corbyn uprising here. So how, and, and it's actually the working classes that are so often supporting um, uh, that 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 movement. Um, so so you know, what where where you know what is the what is the hope? What form of struggle do you think? What form of insurrection do you think is going to be key now? Okay, uh, I'll do a very short answer, and then we we'll open up for questions. Um, I began with that map of the world to try to remember to remind me to say something about the rest of the world. Um, I do fixate on the richest countries, uh, but that is partly because they're a particularly interesting little experiment now. I wrote a book uh, earlier this year called The Equality Effect, uh, published by New Internationalist, who forced me, the editor forced me, um, to look at India and China in particular. The difficulty is uh, that the Chinese statistics are completely flipped from China five years ago apparently being a more equal country to India to China now being a more unequal country as the Chinese state becomes a little bit more honest. And when this kind of thing happens, it is very difficult for, for somebody like me uh, to, to deal with what I'm dealing with. Um, both countries became more unequal. So although the Maoist revolution spread across India at the same time, the rich in India took more and, and more. In recent years, it is likely that the rich in China have begun to constrain how they are behaving and what they're doing, not least with force from above. Um, otherwise, they're doing an amazingly good job of pretending that they are beginning to turn uh, the key. And the last thing to say is, it often is the middle class, not the working class, when you look at it. When you look at who it is in villages who are actually involved in the Maoist revolution, it is the more middle class child rather than the working class child. And in Britain, in that great period from 1920 all the way through, although the trade unions were very important and the strikes were very important, the driving force were the middle class. 
the middle class could no longer afford a doctor in the 1930s. So they helped create a national health service so they could actually um, be treated. The middle class couldn't afford private schools by the 1950s and 60s, and so they brought in a comprehensive movement so their children didn't have to go to secondary moderns. And the left in Britain has never quite understood, even though the left is so middle class, you know, like Corbyn, like me, um, the left has never quite understood how important the middle class has been in the left. It's when you really screw the middle class that things really start to happen quite quickly. The danger is that somebody comes along and looks after the top 30%, which is what Thatcher did, and then the middle class work against the working class. Uh, and that type of anyway, <coughs> questions? Let's go for, let's try and bunch two or three together. So let me take three for now. Could I have the uh, gentleman at the back, please? Yes, sir. Um, Could you speak up, sorry? I, I agree with your account of the equality in the sense of income. I think that in the UK case, you have kind of missed the institutional and social set up. I think there's a kind of cultural apparatus, a mediated apparatus of inequality, which is kind of aside from income inequality. The graph that you give us doesn't actually provide the points that you made. I think we could make a point from the factory period, which you gave us the kind of instance of turning point, if you like. Two points. Firstly, in, in the case of unemployment, there were statistical changes which interfered with our public policy um, indices. 28 times between 1979 to 1988, the unemployment figures were changed. And out of those 29 times, 28 reduced the official figures unemployed. And of course, there was an inverse relationship between vacancy rates and unemployment, and that was in the post-war period. That broke down after those changes. So we don't have the kind of educational furniture to understand what has come about. The statistical rates that we use are bogus and funny about Japan. I think it's slightly misleading to present it as an equal society. There's asymmetrical zones in Japan, which are grotesque. In some of the ghettos in Japan are grotesque. You have 80, 90 year old men who are having to work one to four days in a year just to get one to four days of rent to pay for their hotel. And they've been forced to work at the age of 80 or 90 years of age. I think mean, we should be careful how we use these statistics. But just on a political point, we could deal with inequality at a constitutional level if we wanted to. I mean, just, uh, just at the, the sexual level in terms of gender, we could make it a constitutional convention in the UK to have alternating prime ministers. You know, a fixed term male prime minister, next term a female prime minister. None of our political parties are interested in that. Well, and one is the Green Party. Yeah. Possibly so. Okay, thank you. Could I just ask you to, just in the interest of getting as many people as possible, just try and sort of keep it a little bit um, brief. I had a gentleman over here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Danny. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure that the, the common effect was, just, um, was for all on talent agents to move forward. I think it was as much, I mean, it's a, a cultural reaction to what's happening in the mainstream media and the uh, various types of uh, parliamentary actors. And people are just um, rejecting that as much as actually wanting saying that Corbyn's raised knees or anything like that. That's where I've got, I've got, I've got a question on it. Another thing is, is that um, there's been a lot of discussions over the last couple of years about who, you know, where could people in civil society do X, Y or Z. And there seems to be a growing consensus that at the at grassroots level that we're up to a lower point than we were in the 1930s to fight, say, something like uh, the fascists in Cable Street. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you know, the, you get the same thing happening. The same thing being expressed on the left, the fascist movement and other things as well. So I'm wondering if there's, even if, even if you're right about the Corbyn stuff, mm -hmm. I'm not sure where, any, where it can go from there. Okay. I'm not a Corbyn sceptic, by the way. Right. Can I, I'll do those two. I'm not very good at remembering three. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll take your argument about statistics, but just because they can be manipulated doesn't mean they're worth ignoring. 
Um, it is possible to get statistics to tell you who really was unemployed in the 80s. The lovely thing now is that people are beginning to realise when the government comes out and says we've never had more people unemployed, people just go, so what? It's not good employment. And who wants to have three jobs? Um, so the population is, is partly becoming cleverer. I'm stuck with using numbers but checking them, which I do with Japan. The Japanese government, by the way, have different sets of numbers um, and say that Japan's more unequal. And I do occasionally go. Um, so my experience of a uh, ghetto in Japan, I asked my Japanese colleagues if they'd take me to the poorest part of Japan, geographers do this, um, and it was an area of Osaka, so I might have gone to the right area, it's what they call a ghetto in Osaka, which is Korean, and I said, great, when are you going to take me? And they said, oh no, you can go on your own. And I went, no, you know, I'm not stupid, you don't go to the poorest part of the country on your own. And they said, Okay, may not be, but that was the one that the geographers who had had numbers said. I went there, it was very poor, I'm very big. I didn't go when it was dark, but what shocked me, the difference between Japan and Britain, was that half the bicycles were not locked up. You know, that there are fundamental differences, and it's when you see things, things like that. Japan is not a utopia in many ways, but it is very similar to Scandinavian countries, and we often ignore it. Um, it's also done this without uh, resources like oil. And interestingly, it's done it because of what the Americans did to Japan. I mean, they ironically made it this equal. Corbyn is interesting over, um, you know, he really isn't charismatic, so it isn't him. Um, it would be a bit worrying, you know, if he had kind of slight Tony Blair qualities. You know, Tony Blair, whatever else you might think about him, could get people just to support him because he was him. Um, whereas Corbyn is the very opposite of this. So that's why I think, I agree with you, it's many other things going on, it's not, it's not, it's not him. Um, the left has this kind of sigh of relief because the alternative three to him all have skeletons in their cupboards. Uh, whereas Corbyn is the MP with the lowest expenses and the most boring social life. Um, you know, that, that was just luck. Um, but what... Now, I think if you're thinking about the future, what happens in two or three or four years' time when instead of it being Corbyn, who after all is really supposed to have retired by now, that was his plan before he got elected leader, suppose it's somebody who's half his age and she's female and she is a bit charismatic. Any of 35 women in Labour could do this. Now imagine that versus Boris or Theresa. Right, and then you've got the charisma factor and hope on top. Great, could we take a couple more? Had the lady, yeah. Hello, thank you for the talk, that was really interesting. Um, but I was wondering about, you mentioned the pay cuts for farmers and farmers, and um, I'd like to think that's a really encouraging sign for everyone. Um, I'm quite kind of concerned, however, that maybe that's because there's been a lot of difficulties in the wake of the crisis, which I kind of feel is an ongoing thing. I always think it's funny when people say, oh, the crisis in 2008. I think, is this still not kind of going on? But um, I wonder if maybe they're just taking pay cuts so that the dividends for shareholders can be higher, or maybe it's just a kind of temporary thing that they're in the spotlight and they've kind of, they'd, they'd prefer to be able to keep their position for longer, etc. And it's kind of, they just know that it's just a lesser people, etc. Um, is there, do you have any kind of thoughts on that? Or is that? Yeah. Just take one more, uh, Jens. Yeah. Um, I'm from Denmark, and it's a pleasure to see Scandinavia in the in, in uh, utopia there. Uh, but but uh, it, one thing that's, that struck me was uh, your argument that it was the middle classes that push this kind of, of egalitarian policies. Now, my understanding of, of Danish history and Scandinavian history is that it was the working uh, that, that, that was the labor movement and the labor parties in Scandinavia that threw a, a particular reformist policy, policy where they compromised with capital, uh, achieved uh, uh, extreme uh, improvements quite early on. And, and I do not see the middle class parties in Scandinavia as classically being put forward as the ones that, that changed the, the, the extreme uh, situation of inequalities, but the labor movement. Okay. Let me, let me do those. Um, it could be temporary. 
but a lot of why these very high £5 million a year salaries were taken is purely people competing with other people on their salaries. You know, you can go to four, you can go to three, you can go to two. It doesn't actually change much of what you can do unless you compare yourselves to people inheriting large amounts of money, which began. Um, you don't want to be picked out as the greedy one who's a liability. You're much safer being in the bottom half of the increase. And if it makes sense to be in the bottom half of the increase, you'll have salaries that continue to go down. If it's dangerous to be in the top half, whereas until recently, the better you were as a chief executive, the more your pay should go up. So you were safer in your job if you got a salary increase. That's the kind of madness. We still have that madness with house prices. You know, the government actually thinks that the higher the house prices are in London, the more successful the economy is. Right? Now that can't carry on forever, but, but that explains what, what Osborne is doing. Um, I don't know. But apart from Dane smoking, which they've now stopped, um, which so Denmark was always off our figures slightly because of smoking. Um, I don't know enough about Danish history. All I'll say about British history is we often forget the middle class people who were in there, who were partly not proud of being middle class. Owen Jones is the son of social workers, that's a middle class uh, position. But Clement Attlee was very, very uh, middle class in, in this country. It, it's rarely done by the working class alone. Um, but what you end up with, in Japan, people call it a 90% middle class, which is a 90% working class. These class differences that cannot be sustained in countries with low income inequalities. Whereas in a country like the UK, with these enormous differences, middle class parents will not let their children fall down and take working class jobs because they can't imagine living on the salaries. Um, so it keeps the class structure. If, you, if, you're worried about, if, you, if you're worried about class politics, uh, greater equality actually alters it and makes you unified. Um, then, the great danger is you forget what you've achieved and a few greedy people take a bit more and you don't stop them. But we're not talking about how inequality rises again. Um, Right, a couple more. Um, gentlemen at the back. Hi, you, you were talking about uh, inequality leading to higher predominance of right wing voting, and yet you were also talking about inequality leading to sort of the middle class promoting more yeah. equality. How do those two sides of the coin yeah. balance out, and what influences the way the coin falls? Okay, so I'll do that one quickly. I mean, inequality rose in Germany in the 30s, and, and the coin went one particular way. Actually, ironically, a middle class way. Lots of middle class votes for the Nazis. Um, that's the worst of all worlds is when the middle class decide to go for your far right party. Uh, then you're in very bad uh, trouble. It's a battle. It's, and we're going to have a battle in this country. Uh, there will be a research, currently UKIP are on 1%. Uh, UKIP were on 14%. Uh, just over a year ago. U UKIP, who are our far, our far right party now, who managed to do a clever job of trying to pretend they weren't, their votes only rose with every European election and then their, pos their popularity collapsed afterwards. So they were not a popular movement, they were a movement financed by people who wanted us desperately to leave Europe. UKIP will rise up again, or the equivalent soon, because there'll be anger about what happens next. We won't be able to carry on blaming immigrants much longer. We will carry on for a bit longer than we can, but you, know, you cannot vote to leave and then either leave or find out you can't leave and still blame immigrants. Uh, but some people do that. Uh, but there will be a battle between those who want a more unequal society back to upstairs, downstairs, with guest workers in as servants who can come here but cannot have children, which is what servants, in effect, were. They could be in the big houses in London, but you couldn't have a child. And between people who've got a more idealistic idea about what this kind of place could be. Um, 
And it's a, it's a battle to come. It's, we're going to get poorer. Inflation's coming. Food prices are going up. Student debt's not going to work. My children can't get houses. And I'm in a 3%. Right? Empire 2.0 is not going to happen. The Commonwealth isn't sitting there desperately wanting to trade with us. We haven't got a new set of vacuum cleaners ready to sell. <laughs> Our bankers are not brilliant. Right? The country is getting poorer and about to get more poor. And that leads to vicious politics for a time. That's, that's what's coming. I've been optimistic about the fact we may be at a turning point. Um, but when there's less to go around, you know, the people with a lot who are scared don't give it up easily. I might say, you know, it's really obvious that if you just share a bit more, we can all be happier. That means not sending your child to Eton and Harrow. You send your child to Eton and Harrow because you want to guarantee their future because you're scared about what might otherwise happen. It doesn't change immediately. It doesn't change that, that fast. Gentleman here. Um, it might be related to the question, but you, you, you talked about insurrection and sort of stupidity. Do you think Brexit vote was an act of insurrection or an act of stupidity or both? Or neither? Yeah. Um, okay, I, I, I looked at it a little bit, so I looked at Lord Ashcroft's poll. It's ironic that we had to rely on Lord Ashcroft. It's more reliable than anything else. Uh, and the poll, the poll was the one, the exit poll. Exit polls work. But on other polls, those polls I was showing you, if we ask all of you how you'd vote if there's an election tomorrow, you won't answer me that. You think you would, but you don't. What you answer is how you would have voted if there'd been an election six weeks ago. So the, the polls are spot on about six weeks in the past. Um, the Brexit poll was... Um, I suspect, I mean, it's got a strange geography. Majority bigotry and racism, uh, that's what fits the age profile. Uh, people my age and a bit older who are brought up with textbooks telling them that they were superior, that their country was superior, who've had to go from, in my case, when a pound would buy you 10 francs to 3 francs to a euro. You've got to feel, because most of you are younger than me, what it's like to be my age or older in Britain. Right? And the country was spoiled. The country was great. And then we let all these immigrants in. So bigotry, racism, but wanting a better country for their grandchildren. They're going to die. A, a bit of really extreme sovereignty, you know, not like in European judges, madness, uh, that's very small. And then a little bit of anything but this. Because the choice was between business as usual, with Cameron and the head of Marks and Spencer's leading the charge, or something unknown. So there was a bit of that. But because of it being the old, um, and the middle class, most of the voters were middle class, ABC1. Right? So again, the maths of it. Yes, working class people in Middlesbrough disproportionately voted leave. No, there aren't many of them. Right? What mattered for the vote was all around the Cotswolds. Right? The majority of the leave vote was in the south of England and it was middle class. And it was in areas where people are white, and where people don't like people who are not white because they don't see people who are not white. But they've been told year after year after year that the reason that things are getting worse is immigration in the Express and the Daily Mail, and by the Conservative Party, and by people using words like swamping. Because when you do have rising inequality, for decade after decade, making things worse and worse, you need a scapegoat. You need something to blame. You need to explain why housing is becoming unaffordable. And you can't say, because we're letting the rich get richer so they can buy lots of houses and rent it out to the rest of you. Right? Even though that's why housing became unaffordable. You say, oh, it's the immigrants, they're using up the housing. And you can't tell people, oh, the reason why you can't live on your wage anymore, even though your parents could, and they could start a family and buy a home, you can't say that's because I've taken all the money and you can't have it. You say, oh, it's the immigrants, they're taking away your job. Right? The 
it was largely a bigoted racist vote, as far as I can see. Uh, it wouldn't have gone away. Had it been 52% remain, 48% leave, it would have carried on. What's really interesting is that this kind of lances the boil. You know, either everything's going to be magical in three years' time, um, or it wasn't true. The other thing I should say about it, I don't think we say enough about it. I grew up in the 70s in a mixed race family. Uh, we had the National Fronts spraying on our wall, NF, go home. Right? And that felt really, really bad, and most of you will get why, and I'm white, right? Why the National Front were really nasty and go home, go back to where you come from. I'm amazed that we don't realise that what's going on now with Brexit is just the same to people who are Polish as what I saw in the 70s, what happened to my family in the 70s. But that was about black skin, not about slightly different accents. There's a question up here. Yep. Yeah, thanks for that last comment. Um, I was hoping to hear more from you about the um, more intersection analysis of inequality and how um, racial inequality is a real problem in the UK and it's not really acknowledged as much as the, U the US problem. And I noticed on one of your slides, although you skipped past it, kind of a class next to the UK and race next to the US. Um, and so I just wanted to hear more a bit about that from you. Um, because one of your own quotes, I think, was really doing a huge round of circulation after the Grenfell Tower atrocity about uh, above the fourth floor it tends to be you're more likely to find a round of black child above the fourth floor. So I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about that particular statistics that was really helpful at that time, kind of indicating um, the way in which racial inequality operates in such a violent <coughs> ways in which Okay, I will go. That was a 2001 census stat. I am just nerdy. This is one. 2001 census statistic. I just noticed it that the majority of children in England above the fourth floor aren't white. So if you see a child's face, um, you're able to tell because it's too far away above the fourth floor. But you can tell from the size of the head compared to the window, the child probably isn't isn't white. The reason is because you try not to put children and families above the fourth floor. That was the standard policy of housing. Um, but that wasn't applied to families who were not white. Um, so it occurred. I... Sorry, you said that policy didn't apply to families who weren't white? Yes. It was a policy, but... It was a policy, so housing officers tried as hard as they could yeah. with families. This, this is often families with newborn children. Uh, you try to put them low down in the tower blocks, if you put them in tower blocks at all, because you can't get the pram down the stairs when the lift doesn't work. It's all very pragmatic. Um, there was higher poverty in the 90s amongst families who aren't white, more likely to present yourself to need in housing. And then the question is whether there was less care amongst the housing officials who were back then more likely to be white. But to, to go back to very quickly, to, I've talked mainly about income. We could talk a bit about wealth. But the reason I talk about income is income and wealth inequalities is, I think, what helps sustain other inequalities. So in countries which don't have big income or wealth inequalities, racial differences begin to disappear. The differences in the US are essentially wealth inequalities, from having great-great-grandparents who are slaves with nothing to great-great-grandparents who are slaveholders. The most equal countries in the world, places like Iceland, had slaves. Uh, the slaves were Celtic and the slaveholders were Viking. There was no longer any distinction in Iceland. Japan had, still has some, my friend here knows from Japan, still has some identified racial groups, but there was much more of a hierarchy in the past, partly an aristocratic hierarchy. Now you have the, the opposite thing in Japan. You have a myth of racial homogeneity in a single Japanese genome, and we're all identical. Um, differences, and differences between men and women, in how they're treated, are very hard to sustain if you don't have income differences. If men and women in Britain were paid identical amounts of money on average, that would change many other things. It's not the be all and end all of it, 
but money is how we show our respect for people. Money is how we rank each other. Money is a visceral thing. Um, once you do things, which happened in the last government, of begin to give disabled people the resources they need to live a decent life, you're showing through the giving them money that you respect them as human beings. It's the same with race. Without the money, you don't, you're not treating these people as human like you. And it was the same with men and women. A hundred years ago, women were not seen as human in this part of London. Men would gather in rooms in Bloomsbury and the occasional woman would be allowed in, but they were not seen as human. Um, so I think there's a really interesting connection between money and other forms of inequality, and we often underestimate. Now, last thing to say, the, the money isn't the be all and end all, because you know, one of my children walks into a school now in England, and because of the colour of their skin, assumptions will be made about them, regardless of how much money they've got, they're white children. Uh, my brother walks into a pub and he's not white, people make assumptions about him, regardless of the money. So it's not all about money. But the money creates a kind of society which then tolerates certain forms of, of behaviour. Great. Do you see any more hands? Yeah. Um, hi, that was a great talk. I was wondering if you think there might be a similar kind of turning point or a similar start of insurrection within the United States, um, given that so many people have been talking about the death of the middle class within the United States versus that not really happening so much in other European yeah. countries. Yeah, I'll do that quickly. There's a quote from Roseanne, the comic, about your middle class in the United States till they turn their electricity off. And the bulb goes. So a kind of, um, I mean, people in the States were told, they went for Bernie, and they're told you can't go for Bernie, you've got to go for Hillary, otherwise he will get in. So it's a really interesting position um, people are now in. And they're just beginning to learn more and more about their, their country, as far as I can see. Uh, the way in which if you have my job in an American university, you don't tell people this stuff. What you do is you set your students an essay, and the essay is, in 1,000 words, explain why the United States has the highest life expectancy in the world, and why people do so well. You send your students away to the library, and then they discover for themselves that it isn't true. In fact, they have the lowest life expectancy amongst which countries. But that's the problem of learning. You, you know, it's obviously... I'd probably get shot, to be honest, if I was a US academic, wouldn't I? For lack of patriotism and, and cynicism. Um, but you're beginning to, you're beginning to see it. Uh, and I think one of the best arguments is, clearly, voting for Bernie wouldn't have let Trump in in a way that voting for Hillary kept Trump out. You know, that particular argument's gone. But Bernie, a bit like Corbyn, somewhat boring, older man who kind of likes the 60s and 70s. There's another generation to come. Not everything was great about the 60s and 70s. Um, there's another generation to come. I think it's particularly hard, though, for the United States because this kind of crashing down is quick. For Britain, we became the second richest country around about 1903 to the US, but hardly noticed. In 1945, Australia overtook us. Switzerland had a little bit earlier, but it was a kind of slow and gradual kind of jump down to we became seventh, at which point we created the G7, so we could still, so we could still be in it. Uh, in the last four years, we've gone down from 12th to 16th, faster than ever before, and we're plummeting towards 25th in the moment. So we spend loads of money. We're the fattest, unfittest country in Europe. So what do we do? we buy medals in the Rio Olympics, and we're, we're number two. Which country is more unfit and fatter than us? It's the United States, who wins even more medals. You know, you've got a feeling these countries have severe problems with how they're, how they're conceived. Um, but what I'm, what I'm, my worry is, the UK is still learning that it's not a special country with a genetically superior people. Um, the United States, is going to have to learn this in a much shorter amount of time. But by the way, the reason why we have these ideas of the British race and our superiority, if you ever wondered why Gove and Boris think like they do and quote Kipling, right? why they do it? Um, 
Imagine that you were the richest country on the planet at the time that somebody publishes a book called The Origin of Species, The Survival of Favoured Races. Right? Your elite automatically assume that they have an empire that's bigger than any other in the history of the world because the British is superior. No other country was in a position, bless them, to make that huge mistake. That, that mistake is still there in the elite of Britain. It will eventually go. But if you're trying to understand hard Brexit and a particular set of right-wing conservative ministers and their kind of absolute belief that we can do this, George Osborne, two years ago, said if you follow the plan, we'll be the richest large country on the planet by 2030. Where does that kind of thinking come from? It comes from Magdalen College, Oxford. It comes from Westminster School. It comes from the Osborne family. It comes from the friends around them. And it comes from the 1860s and 1870s and 1880s. Right. And it, yeah, excuses about why Britain is a crap country. That's But, because the ideas, the ideas were kept alive. I mean, these were common ideas of, of, for eugenics in the 1920s and 30s. Again, here in Bloomsbury, you know, including the left-wingers. Um, and then in the 60s and 70s, the Mayfair Club and another small group of people kept them alive. You know, why do you have schools that cost £35,000 a year? You have schools, this is our boarding schools, our top private public schools, you have schools that cost £35,000 a year because there are some children who've got special genes who we have to spend that much money on their education because they're going to make the country... Well, otherwise you wouldn't have them. Now, the rest of the world has learned not to do this. And the poor pressure that goes on these boys, it's largely boys, what the average OECD country does is spend more on children who are slower in their state schools because they need more help. Right? Not what we do. Okay, I'm going to try and take a final round of questions now, um, and then we actually have a drink seminar afterwards, which you are all invited to, which will be taking place in the senior common room, so you're welcome to um, keep the conversation going. But can I see a show of hands? Just a few here and there. No? Oh, it's dead time. I'd like to bring it back to the uh, question of immigration and the fact that it's all showing up in statistics and statistics mm. being uh, What if we started showing how many people are leaving Britain and starting to do an overseas? Would that influence how people feel about the immigration issue? Okay, let's, let's end on that. If we, if we, well, we were very bad at counting people out. So in the 91 census and 2001, we discovered that a million more people had left than we, we thought. And recently we discovered that almost every overseas student actually goes, because it's, it's not that great. Um, as a country, we've exported far more people than we've ever imported. Um, and, and, but, and, and this gets back to the, the genetic and the very strange kind of behaviour. We kind of still have a rule in England uh, that we're going to have to get over, which is that you, if you're born here, you're supposed to be patriotic. If you come here, you're supposed to adopt that particular patriotism and that's the cricket test, and you should be part of this. If you go abroad, you should still keep that patriotism about Britain. You shouldn't assimilate with anybody else. And you're never an immigrant, you're always an expat. Now, that language and that way of thinking about what other people in Europe call mobility, they don't actually say immigrant and immigrant, that language that you're always English fits back to those eugenic ideas about the special race. William Beveridge, you know, helped bring in the welfare state. William Beveridge said it was a duty of every middle class Englishman, not the working class because they had slightly dodgy genes, but every middle class Englishman should have four children for the good of the race. Um, and that was Beveridge. Now, there are changes over time but the thinking of superiority is still there. When you see those conservative men talking and sitting and strutting, what keeps them going 
is their self-knowledge that inside them they are superior. And I don't think it'll ever go from them, but I don't think their grandchildren will have it. That's my hope. Yeah. And I think we'll get there, but this is why it's an insurrection, it's beginning, but you're battling against something which is very, very powerful. And it's a core belief amongst certain people that this is their country, they made it great, they created the world's greatest ever empire. The empire should be grateful to them for it. The empire was the white man's burden. Britain never made any money from the empire. The reason we became poorer in the 1970s wasn't because the last few countries gained independence. It was our trade unions. And they say that because they honestly think that we ran an empire for the good of the planet. And it's been misrepresented by people who don't understand what a wonderful thing the British Empire truly was. I'm never going to persuade them, but they're going to die slightly earlier than me. <laughs> it's their children and their children's children I'm interested in. Because at some point, this has to go for the mentality of this country. And it will. It's just a question of how much pain are we going to go through before it goes. You know, how quickly are we going to learn? Thank you.